Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a great, great um, Wednesday. It's the middle of the month, middle of the week. Actually, it's not the middle of the month. It's only the middle of the week. Feels like the middle of the month, though, because I've gotten a lot done. I've already messed up this morning. My water is uh, way over there. But that's okay. We have a little coffee. Who needs water when you have coffee, right? My new baby's going to come any day now. My wife's currently a, ju a du uh, jury duty because that's what every pregnant lady needs in her life. So that means I have a nice full day to do work with no distractions, ideally. We will see. We had um, lots and lots of questions sent in by all of you. I want to thank you for all of that. Now I have a million topics to discuss. So if you sent in topics and I don't get to yours within the next uh, three months, don't, don't be surprised because I have a million topics. So, should we get right Should we wait a second? We'll wait a second. As you can see, my diapers have all been removed. We're out of diapers. We have to buy new diapers. Somehow, we now have um, infant diapers, one-month-old diapers, diapers for James's age, which is like two years old, and then nighttime diapers for James because James has a big bladder and he loves peeing. So, we currently have at least four types of diapers in the apartment, maybe five. It's too many. At least in my opinion. Then again, my opinion does not matter. We're going to talk about this a little while later. Um, one of the questions that was sent in was a good one. It was essentially, how do you be humble like Jonathan Little? And I don't necessarily know if I am extremely humble, but I think a lot of people get in their minds that their opinion matters a lot more than it does, and that they are more relevant than they actually are or that they know more than they actually know and it's important to understand that in almost all situations your opinion does not matter you don't know a lot and sometimes you just have to deal with things so um i'm okay with four types of diapers in the apartment it's not ideal for me i'd prefer to have well prefer james to just be potty trained but you don't get to pick <laughs> all right today let's talk about bluffing the question was, when I raise preflop but then miss on the flop, when do I keep firing on the turn when I miss? Okay, well, a few things were already mentioned in that. Uh, first things first, why do you continuation bet the flop 100% of the time? Remember, the situation is I raise preflop, let's say somebody called, doesn't matter if it's big blind or, um, or you know, out of position or in position. Flop comes, you do not need to make a blind continuation bet. That's going to get you in a lot of trouble if your opponents are anywhere near decent. In my first poker book, if you're on Instagram, you can see it. It's the green one up there. Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, Volume 1. I actually do say you probably should make a 100% continuation bet because opponents fold too often in general. That is true, but as I have played against better and better players, turns out they don't fold as often. So, you cannot continuation bet 100%. If you find that you are having a difficult time playing the turn in the river because your range is so junky, because you're betting everything, you have to understand that if your opponents are not folding enough on the flop and perhaps the turn barrels, you're going to be very easy to play against because all they have to do is call the flop and then see what you do. Um, we've discussed this a few times where essentially at every point in the hand, there are players who will essentially act honestly at some point. So say I raise preflop and then bet the flop, but then only bet the turn with a good hand and check every time I have garbage. All my opponents have to do is just get to the turn and they immediately win, right? So that's not good. You don't want to let that happen. If you're here on YouTube or Facebook, say hello. I'm not sure it's working. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Okay. So first things first, maybe, you sh maybe you're continuation betting too often. Next. All right, good, we're here. Good, good, good. Hello from Finland. In my um, unfortunate education as an American student, I could not point at Finland on a map. How sad, huh? I think it's in, I think it's in the Scandinavian region. I honestly don't know, though. How sad. Um, okay, next. Let's say you raise preflop, big blind calls, flop comes, whatever. 972, they check, you decide to bet. Okay, 
The turn is whatever. When should you be betting again with your garbage? This was the actual question. So, typically, you want to be betting again when the board changes such that it improves your range or really hurts your opponent's range. Usually those are going to go hand in hand. And also the newly found strong hands you actually do have in your range, right? So let's say you raise preflop with 6-5 suited. Flop comes, jack 7-3. You bet, they call. Find spot to bet the flop with a gut shot. Bad gut shot with no showdown value. Turn is um, a king, right? That is a great spot to keep betting because the king is very good for you and very bad for your opponent, right? Your opponent's not check calling out of position with king high, but you would bet with ace king, king queen, king 10, king 9, right? So you have all the kings. Also, in that scenario, your opponent likely has a jack or worse, right? So if they're sitting here with 7-8, or 7-6, or ace-3, and the turn is a king, they're very likely to just fold at this point. So, this is a very obvious spot to keep betting because the turn helps you a lot and hurts your opponent, even though you're still sitting here with 6 high, right? Your hand is not what is so relevant. What's relevant here is the king drastically changes the board in your favor. You can figure this out just by using Equalab, a free program on the internet. If you run your... Um, range once you get to this point which means the range you bet the flop with against the range your opponent gets to the turn with that range that they check call the flop with um, you're going to see that you're in pretty nice shape here with your range against them let's say you do bet that 6-5 turns a king let's say the river is now an ace okay in that scenario well now you should also keep betting because your opponent is still in here with mostly jack x and worse so if they have jack x and worse well, a king is scary. Now, a king, uh, an ace is scary. This is a definitely a spot where you need to bet the turn and bet the river. Very obvious triple barrel spot. You have no other play. If you're giving up in the spot, you are messing up, and you're not betting nearly often enough. Um, you do have to understand that if your opponent does have ace jack or ace seven or ace three, they are going to be in this hand. They are going to call you. But they also have queen jack, jack ten, jack nine, jack eight, right? They have all this stuff. Pat says, what do you do if they raise? Well, on the river or the turn, if they raise, you fold. When they raise, their range should be incredibly strong to raise into you because you have a very obvious range advantage. In general, whenever you, the better, has the obvious range advantage, your opponent should very rarely be raising because, think about this, on jack, seven, three, king, the preflop raiser has kings, jacks, sevens, threes, and king, jack. The caller only has sevens and threes, right? Which means the preflop raiser has a huge advantage here, and you just cannot check raise into that player. And if you do, you're screwing up a lot. Um, also, preflop raiser has some also other really strong hands like ace king, aces, king queen. These are all pretty good too. Whereas the preflop caller probably doesn't have aces, ace king, maybe not king queen. So this is just a spot where you're not going to get raised. And if you do get raised, it means your opponent's bad and they're raising too much. So you need to just structure your range such that you're defending appropriately, right? Oh, you want to come in? Oh, come here for a second. Come here. Why are you crying? What's up? Oh, you want to say hello? Here's James. Hi. He's saying hello. Why are you crying? It's time for your breakfast. You want some coffee? Coffee. No, no coffee. Only for me. Can you say hello to everyone? Hi. Hi. Can you say hi? No. Can you say bye-bye? No. No? no? Can you say cookies? Cookies. Nom, 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 nom. Okay. Bye. Go go hang out and have your breakfast, okay? Okay. Okay. See you later. No, you go out and shut it. Go out and shut it. You want to stay in? You can stay in. Fine. Okay. James wants to stay in. Whoa. I know, Mom. You want to sit with me or do you not want to sit with me? Oh. Mom. They can't see you over there. You're looking at the wrong camera. Here. You have to stay here. Okay. No. No? No. No, no. Nah. nah. This is James. He is nice. He's the one we wake up early for. <laughs> You're so heavy. You're so big and so heavy. I'm no boy. Whew. James used to be a, a little boy. 
Now he's now he's a big boy. That baby is bigger than you, man. Yes, it's a big baby. Next baby is big too. Next baby, they said maybe like nine pounds when it comes out. It's gonna be a big baby. Okay, we have a lot of questions about this hand. Um, say we did have, say we did turn a four, right? Remember, boards jack, seven, three, four, and we have six, five. Would you check, James? Yes or no? You're, you're stomping up and down as if you would say yes. So, let's see if we can get James in this picture real quick. Here he is. Say hello. Hello. Okay, good, 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 good. That's that's him for the, all the Instagram people. Oh, no, I'm messing up my everything. Boy. Let's see if we can get him over here. Can you say hello? Hello. Can you say hello over here? Hello. 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 He's grinding it out. Hello. All right. Back on topic. Sorry for everyone who's listening to this on iTunes. This is not going to be a very good episode hello. for you. Yeah, that's me. That's me on the computer. Hello. Okay. Should we keep betting on a turn four when we turn the nuts? Don't, don't, do not press the computer. The answer is very obviously yes. The turn four is essentially a blank, right? The only card hand that really helps is um, six five. Yeah, I'm talking right now. But the cameras are up here. Should you keep betting on a four? Yes. The four is essentially a blank. It's not exactly a blank, but it's pretty much a blank because six five is the main hand that improves. On Jack seven three, right? Only what four three gets oh, there? Maybe no, seven four suited. Mommy. Does that make sense, James? No. Does that make sense? Mommy. You want to come sit up here? No. Please. Mm. Please. He just wanted to interrupt the show today. Okay. Um. Someone asked, "What if the turn was an ace?" Yes. Obviously, keep betting. Ace is just like a king. And if the river a turn was an ace and the river was a king, so not king ace. Um, you should probably still keep betting as well. You're going to find that anytime you have, like, just the nut low in a spot where the turn and or river helped you, you generally want to keep betting. It's also very useful to have additional equity, okay? So how do you have additional equity? Well, in this spot, we have gut shots, right? We have the gut shot straight draw. So if you bet the turn and get called, you're still just going to win, like, 9% of the time with the nuts. So... That's the situation where you definitely want to keep betting. Um, usually it's pretty obvious when you want to keep betting whenever you either have a very clear draw and the board changes. What if the board doesn't change? Let's say instead it actually helps your opponent. Like let's say the turn was a nine. Oh. So jack seven, three, nine. If you think about that situation, then your opponent, if they have top pair, they're just not folding. If they had a seven, it usually has a, a gut shot to go with it at least. So that is not a spot that you want to keep betting. Even though you could have the 10-8. Oh you know, I'm the one they're, they're recording, right? It's not you. Why? Come here. Let's sit right up here. Don't say hello. Oh. Do you have any advice about this spot? No. No, no advice? Look, there's Mike Sexton. You see him? Yes. What, what do you see? Gold. Gold. Oh, yeah, gold. Gold bracelet. Oh, don't drop it. Don't drop it. No. Okay. Are you going to go have your breakfast? No. No, you don't want to eat? No. Why not? No. Please? No. Nom, 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 nom. Eggies. Look, I have you. Whenever James was a baby, I would hold him no. just like this. No. And run. <laughs> You're too big for you. You can do it now. All right. Ugh. Connection's bad on YouTube. Sorry. I can't fix the connection. <laughs> no. Just came says you want uh, one of those bracelets so bad. Well, um, you can't get those anymore. They're from Bellagio. These are old bracelets here. They gave these out at Bellagio for a little while. They're actually made of gold. This was from the um, it says SpadeClub.com. No sure why. No clue why it says SpadeClub.com. Two thousand nine. Retro. 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 Oh, wow. Maybe not. Yeah, oh, wow. So anyway, you can't get that anymore. <laughs> I think I actually won a $500 tournament to get that. It was, um, that was a good one. It was a one-day oh, tournament. 
Dad. Sponsored by apparently Spade Club. I don't even know what that is. Whoa. And My dad hey, Nito. hey, I'm the one talking. And um, <laughs> it was a one-day tournament. I got three-handed with these two players who were just super tired, super worn out at like 7 a.m. And we just kept playing. We kept playing. They wanted to chop. I would not chop. They were falling asleep, and I outlasted them. Yeah, don't push the button. You want to press wave at living the search? Is that what you're trying to do? No. You want to wave at another? There's someone named James on Instagram. James. Do you, want, James. you want to wave at the other James? Hi. 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 Kevin, oh, you're saying hi? James is waving at the computer. You don't think James needs me to talk? Right, that's true. If you guys just want to sit here and listen to James talk, we can do that. Do you want to talk for a while? Oh, it's time for breakfast. Oh, shit. James almost spilled my coffee. <laughs> okay, go have your food. Bye. Bye. Thank you. James almost spilled the coffee. Um, <laughs> I literally almost spilled the coffee. Okay, back to work. Um, okay. The times that are pretty obvious to keep betting are when you bet with like some sort of backdoor draw and the turn obviously gives you more outs. Like let's say um, you raise with jack 10 of hearts, slops comes seven, four, two, one heart, right? If the turn is a heart, a nine or an eight, you should definitely keep jacking. Uh, keep, uh, keep jacking, oh my God. You should definitely keep betting. <laughs> you should definitely keep betting. Um, let's say the turn is a 10 or a jack, giving you top pair, you should also keep betting. So, in that scenario, you should just certainly keep firing, right? Um, if the turn is an ace or a king in that spot, you should also, ace, king, or queen, you should also keep firing, though. Not because it helps your hand, but because it helps your range. So, in this spot, we raise with the jack, 10 of hearts, big blind calls, it comes 7, 4, 3. We get to bet on the ace, king, queen, jack, ten, nine, eight, or heart. As you see, that is a lot of cards we're going to keep betting. If the turn is a seven, we're not going to keep betting, because that's really good for the opponent, right? He has all the sevens. What about a four or two, or whatever the low cards are? We probably don't need to bet those either, but we could. Like, a two is pretty decent, just because it. if we have our over pairs, we're still in good shape. So maybe we are supposed to keep betting on a two, if the bottom card pairs. Um, if it's a, like a three, so seven, seven, four, three, seven, four, two, three, you should probably check. But again, betting's probably just fine there too. So anyway, that's the spot we're going to keep, keep betting a lot. And that really does show you the power of just having a suited hand because when you flop a backdoor straight or blackboard flush draw, you get to keep barreling on a lot of turns. Same thing for just like good connected cards. Suited connected cards are good, not because they necessarily make the nuts a lot, but because you get to keep barreling a lot. And that allows you to pick up the pot a huge portion of the time. What about the flop and turn sizing when you get a good card? That depends a lot on your stack, not necessarily um, the way uh, your exact hand. Usually, though, whenever you are bluffing, not always. This is where uh, people get me in trouble when they try to quote me. Um, usually, when you're bluffing in these spots, you're going to have not a showdown value hand, right? So since you don't have something like an ace high that's betting thinly or something like king queen that could win a showdown even if you do get called, when you're betting like jack high or six high, you're not going to win a showdown, right? So usually that means you want to polarize your range by betting big because you need to maximize fold equity with your bluffs and you want to play big pots with your nut hands. So in that scenario, you're often going to want to bet relatively big on the turn, just like you would bet with your sets, right? And by playing your sets and your draws in the same manner, you're going to be very difficult to play against. We discuss this extensively at PokerCoaching.com. Um, this is what our homework questions are. We're trying to figure out how to separate our bluffs into big bets and small bets and how to separate our value hands into big bets and small bets and figuring out how to check in a way such that our checking range is not easy to push around. Let's see. James is very social. Yes, he is. He loves to talk. What is my opinion on vaccination? Oh, I'm not a doctor. I, I didn't know if you all are aware of this, but I'm certainly not a medical profession professional. Um, I don't think I've taken a single medical class, so I have no opinion on vaccinations. 50-50 between James and me on interesting content. Yes, that's probably true. Why do people always want to chop? Because they're afraid to gamble. They didn't realize that they went to the casino. All right. 
She was up big this past Saturday and found herself not playing much. She didn't want to lose her winnings. How do you get over that? Um, realize that each session is, is a part of one long session and whether or not you're up or down on the day does not matter. Maybe you're playing too big. Maybe, you know, locking up a little bit of a win is significant for you. And if that's the case, you should be playing much, much smaller. No conspiracy theories here. I'm not sure what conspiracies we're talking about. Maybe the conspiracy is that James knows more than, uh, talks more than 50% of me. Kevin says, never chop. If you beat me, more power to you. I would not necessarily think like that. I would think more in the terms of if I chop, I am, what am I giving up, right? You are giving up experience, right? You really, really want to get experience playing in tournaments where the prize is significant. You want to, you want to get experience playing for a lot of money. And also, you're giving up an edge that you may have if your opponents are going to play poorly, right? Like in that $500 tournament where we won this, this little bracelet, which is apparently worth like $5,000 in gold, or at least it was worth $5,000 in gold. They were selling them for that. You could actually buy replacements for five dollars um, in this tournament, I had a huge edge on the opponents because they were tired, playing poorly, and I was just sitting there playing perfectly fine because I'm capable of playing for quite a while. And I knew I signed up for a one-day tournament, right? Um, the opponents, though, they, they realized they probably didn't have an edge and they wanted to chop. I have chopped a few times. Um, the times I have chopped are when they're going to give me a significant equity advantage. Um, one time, at Bluxy, actually, I won a tournament, and then the next day, I somehow made it to the final four. I had 10% of the chips. One guy had 50%. Everybody else had like 25% or 20%. They had 20%. So it was like 20, 20, 10, 50, give or take. And I proposed we chop it evenly, 25% each. Because I knew the guy with 50% of the chips really wanted the bracelet and the trophy. Actually, I have, a bra I have one of these bracelets. I'll show you what I... Here it is. This is what he wanted very badly. This is an old tarnished one that's made of silver. Look at that. That looks awful, doesn't it? This is why perhaps you make jewelry out of gold instead of jewelry out of silver. Anyway, he wanted this bracelet. It says uh, Beau Rivage on it. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to see that because silver and diamonds look the same. Um, anyway, he wanted this bracelet really badly. So I agreed that we agreed to give him the bracelet if he would um, give us 25% of the money each. So we did that, and it was good. Another time I was playing heads up with a world-class player. He was player of the year at the time when I was, it was like my second, first year on the tournament circuit, or second year. And he agreed to essentially pay me $5,000 in cash to chop with him. So sure, if you're going to give me give me 5000 in cash to chop, I will chop with you. 5000 on top, you know, 5000 on top of a fair, a fair deal. So says the casino is a long-term winner now because everyone's playing GTO. That is absolutely not true. Games are alive and well. If you've played locally in any American casino, you'll know that to be the case. In Europe, though, I do think a lot of people are getting way better. All right, let's see. If you got a bracelet, why would you not play for first place? Well, typically what they would do is they would... Um, chop the money and then play for the bracelet, which often just means everybody's going all in over and over. To some extent. Um, and then, then you'd like flipping for the bracelet. How do you feel about an ICM chop? That's the fair way to chop. It's the only fair way to chop. What do you do on a downswing? Do we do anything differently on a heater? No, just keep playing, keep studying, always work hard. All right, so what else were we talking about? Times, spots to keep barreling. Okay, let's say we raise ace-king. Big blind calls. Flop comes 6-4-2. They check. We bet. They call. In almost all situations, you're not going to want to keep betting ace-king on the turn. That's a situation where you do have an advantage, pre-flopping on the flop, but once they call your flop bet, it starts to get way worse. And on like a queen, they could just be sitting here with a queen, especially if you didn't bet too big on the flop. And you have showdown value with your ace king, right? This is very different than if you had jack 10. With jack 10, you're very often going to keep barreling the turn because again, 
If it comes ace, king, queen, you get to bluff those. Jack, 10, you make the, the straight, or the, the top pair, so you get to keep betting. Uh, lower than a 10, though, it's kind of dicey on, like, 6, 4, 2. So you don't get to bet as often in that scenario. But that's okay. You're going to lose sometimes. But you still see you get to keep betting half the time. And that's going to be quite significant and be very nice for you. So typically you want to keep barreling when you lack showdown value. And ideally, the board changes in a way that is good for your range and not good for your opponents. Multi-way, you need to be way more cautious because it is very likely someone has something. And if someone has something, well, they're probably not going to be folding too often if you just keep blasting, right? Because someone's going to have something. So don't keep bluffing in those spots. There are times where it's just obvious your opponent likes their hand, right? If they are, like, pumped up, they're ready to go. If you're playing at 6 a.m. after a long day, a long, a long uh, session, and someone's been really tired, then all of a sudden they perk up and they're ready to play a hand, uh, you probably don't want to be putting chips in the pot in that hand. So be very, very careful with that. In general, though, you just want to keep asking yourself, do I still have equity, right? Like, can I still make a reasonable hand if I bet the turn and get called? Do I mind betting my hand and then folding to a raise? That's also an important thought because, like, if you have 6-5 on jack-7-3 king and you get check-raised, you don't care. You have, like, 9% equity, right? 9% equity is nothing. It's fine to just fold that out. Um, you don't necessarily want to be betting with hands that you will be getting roughly the right price to call with. So very often, like, if you have, let's say king queen on jack 10 4 2 that's the spot you may not want to bet the turn because if you think about the opponent's check calling range it's going to be a lot of jacks and tens and those are not going to fold on a two turn so very often you don't want to get raised off of your king queen and your opponent's not folding a jack and may not fold a 10 so there's no point in bluffing there if instead though you had jack 10 if you had um 8 7 jack 10 4 2 if you had 8-7 there with a gut shot, you don't mind betting because if you bet and get raised, you can still fold. Or same thing like king-9, something like that with a gut shot. You can bet, and then if you get raised, you can still fold. No problem. So that's also something you want to take into account. What ratio amount should you bet? It depends on the scenario and how many bluffs you have. As you have more bluffs in your range, you want to be betting bigger. But you have to make sure you're relatively balanced. All right, we have a million questions coming in, so we're going to move off that topic. What is ICM? That is the independent chip model. It essentially means that, let's say, you have half the chips in play, three-handed, and the other two people have 25%. The guy with half the chips should not get half of the money in play. Because, like, imagine first place is 40% of the money, or 60%, 50% of the money. The guy's not guaranteed to get first place. So essentially, it accounts for the fact that you're not going to take each place equally often. Um, there are many programs on your phone. There's a website called ICMizer that can easily do this for you. And I, um, I use that program a lot to study these short stack scenarios. Uh, really, you, need, you definitely need to understand ICM. Why are Europeans better players than Americans? Because they get to play many, many more hands than Americans. And the players in Europe or you know, often it's not America, often they have fewer opportunities than Americans. Not necessarily for all European countries, but many of them, especially the uh, Western European countries. Not Western, Eastern? Eastern European countries. Often there, poker is a real way to accumulate wealth, whereas in, like, America and, and Germany and whatnot, they have many, many more opportunities to just get they have many more opportunities, right? And as you lack opportunities, you're going to find that even making 20 bucks an hour from poker or any online game is significant. And that leads a lot of people to playing the games. But in general, um, as people, as the player pool plays more hands, that's going to weed out the winners and the losers. And if you are a winner playing against other winners, well, you're going to get very, very good as opposed to Americans where there has not been enough time to weed out the losers. So it's, Good people playing against weaker people, but their skills are not improving as fast. They can't play online nearly as easily as they can in Europe, which is another reason, right? You play many, many more hands per hour than on, a lot online than you do live. There are a lot of reasons for this, but it's well known that European recreational players are typically, on average, way better than American recreational players. It's just how it is. Unfortunate, but it's how it is. I say it's unfortunate. I don't even know if it's unfortunate. I guess it's good. 
since you can't play much poker when you're at work, you mostly play tournaments and you have some decent results. Okay, good. All right, let's see. Why do Europeans get to play more hands? Because they have online poker. They can play four or eight or 20 games at a time, whereas Americans are sitting there playing one, two at their local casino, playing 30 hands an hour. So who's going to get more experience? The guy playing 300 hands an hour or the guy playing 30 hands an hour, right? Also, they have access to tracking software that when you're playing live, you don't really get access to that. So they can study way, way easier. They can find mistakes they're making way, way easier. And that's all very, very powerful. What adjustments do we make to live tournaments when attempting to bluff players who play too many hands. While they're looser, they have more junk in their range. Well, that's exactly it. You have to ask, are they going to fold their junk? Very often, people will limp pre-flop, call a raise, check fold the flop when they miss, and that's it. Those are players that are easy to play against. It's a little bit more difficult if they're going to be raising you a lot or calling a lot and then check raising turn or calling them leading turns. That makes it more difficult, but as long as you understand their range is mostly garbage, if you are playing strong ranges yourself, then you'll be fine. In Australia, barreling doesn't seem to work much due to players who like to chase to the river. Well, Boomer, I think you just answered your own question. If they chase to the river, make sure you're bluffing the river frequently. If the players are going to be in the pot with a lot of garbage on the river, just bluff the river a lot, right? Easy game. So triple barrel more. Or, or maybe better yet, raise with a more linear range and just value bet thinly. Value bet your middle pair. Right? If they're going to be calling you with ace high, value bet middle pair. Whenever someone is a calling station, I discuss this in my book. Um, which one? Which one's a good one to talk about? Let's do this one. Drops another bracelet on the floor. We got this one from Turks and Caicos in 2007. Um, strategies for beating small stakes poker cash games. I discuss this extensively in this book. Let's go find it. Uh, calling Stations, page 33. We discuss exactly how to play against Calling Stations. You can get this at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash books. Or you can get the audiobook completely for free on Audible at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash free. So we discuss how to play against Calling Stations in this book. This is a quick, easy read. This is not a difficult book, as you see. Not much to it in terms of in-depth range charts, etc., etc. I mean, we do have a few range charts to explain which hands to play pre-flop. I think. Do we? Pretty sure I do. Yeah, we have a few range charts just explaining, like, basic ranges to play in most situations. But nothing too advanced. And really, you don't need to do anything too advanced to beat calling stations because you just value bet more and bluff less. But if you do know people get to the river with a very weak range, because that's just how they operate... You should be bluffing the river a ton. Let's see. What to understand if you... Nate, I'm not sure what you're saying. Nate, I have no clue what you're talking about. All right. Um, what amount should you bet? We discussed that. Your opinion on vaccination is not doing it at all. Well, make sure your opinion is uh, well-founded in facts. If you're looking up facts on the internet, you may be messing up. Um, I highly suggest you do a clinical trial with, you know, I don't know, 20,000 kids. Give some of them vaccinations and some of them not vaccinations. See which ones get sick, see which ones don't get sick. And I bet this has already been done. Cool thing about the world is that a lot of exper experiments you want to run have actually already been ran by governments. Not by the government actually doing it, but by, imagine, in America, let's say they vaccinate all the kids. And then in, I don't know, Latvia, they don't vaccinate all the kids. I don't know, a completely random place that popped in my head. Well, you now have two populations, one that has been vaccinated, one that has not been vaccinated, and you can figure out, perhaps, how that works. Now, that said, maybe Latvians are not um, exposed to perhaps the same things that they're vaccinating Americans for. So maybe they just won't get sick because of that. Make sure you keep that in mind. I mean, this is just me talking as a logical human and not as a medical professional. But if you're not a medical professional, like an actual vaccine doctor, realize your opinion is probably not very relevant. A lot of people like to find things that they cannot explain and then try to blame things that they witness on those things that they cannot explain. Um... 
I mean, for example, you hear whenever, like, someone dies, they say, God wanted them to die. I mean, I don't know. It's like stuff like this. Can't explain why the young child died. That's just something that doesn't make sense in my head. Why else would the child die unless God just wanted him to be back with him? Like, no, in reality, the kid got sick and he died. Or whatever. The kid got hit by a bus and he died. It's unfortunate, but that is the world we live in, and it's very important to realize that is the world we live in, where things happen pretty much randomly, and very often you cannot do anything about it. Like today, if James goes outside and gets hit by a bus, that's going to be really unfortunate. But I understand that that is a possibility when he walks outside on the street in Manhattan, right? People get hit by buses all day, every day. And if you go outside, you are live to get hit by a bus. Anyway, what a great topic that led to. All right. Your favorite bluff is to... Call continuation, but out of position. Lead the turn on boards that miss villains' range. So, Prowl, the problem with that line is that very few hand cards should miss the villains' range, right? Instead, it's more of cards that help you. Like, say it does come Jack-7-3. What cards miss the villains' range? Think about that, right? If, um... The opponent had ace-jack. What what cards miss his range? Clearly, if the opponent had a range advantage, there are not cards that miss the opponent's range. There are cards that help you. Now, that may, does make sense. Like, say turns a nine, jack seven, three, nine. Certainly, that's the spot that helps you more than the opponent. But that doesn't miss your, your opponent, right? Because their opponent could just be easily sitting there with jack nine or ten, eight, or something like that. And if that's the case, obviously, it doesn't miss them. Say the turns a, a two, jack seven, or two. That, in theory, misses your opponent's range, but it still helps them because their range was ahead of yours anyway, and that misses both players. So be very careful with that idea. Um, it can get you in trouble if your opponents are not good and they don't defend their blinds well. Or don't, don't, defend, don't defend well. Callum makes an interesting point that... Um, in Europe, a lot of people don't know about poker. It's not in their, their culture. I don't know if that's necessarily true or not. It's an interesting point, though. That like If you do get into poker as a person who does not play poker in their culture, you must actually be really into it. Whereas in America, like every kid plays poker. I mean, I didn't play poker as a kid, but most kids play poker. And um, maybe that's, that's a true statement. Maybe that you just find more inspired people getting into the game. And if you're inspired, you will be more likely to um, to try your best and, and work hard. All right. Considering no info, 100 people line stack, would you 4-bet, 5-bet all in? Wait, what would be my 4-bet, 5-bet all in range? I don't have any range charts right now, so I'm not going to discuss that. We discussed that thoroughly at pokercoaching.com. All right. You're reading this book. It's very good. Good. We need to be visualizing by charts while playing. You need to be visualizing ranges and understand which hands are in your opponent's range and which are not. You don't necessarily need to be memorizing specific ranges because let's say you raise under the gun in the big blind calls as opposed to you raise button in big blind calls. The range should be very different, right? So it's important to just understand how your range go, um, interacts with their range and how each range interacts with the board. So it's all about studying the game away from the table. It's not about memorizing situations, although, of course... There are, I don't know, a thousand common situations that come up every day. But there are a lot of corner cases, and that's where a lot of the edges are made because, like, everybody knows roughly how to play their aces, right? Try to get money in the pot. But the medium strength hands are the tough ones, and those are the ones where you can make pretty big blunders. Anyway, we would study all this over at PokerCoaching.com. So, yes. The green book I'm showing is a good supplement to the bigger one. This is a more basic book than Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Mastering Small Stakes is way more in-depth and um, definitely a, a better book. This is more of an introduction guide. I actually made this for people on Twitch. People on Twitch essentially told me... They essentially told me that... They essentially told me that they are not going to buy a $30 book. It's too expensive. So I decided to make a $5 book, and those sold like hotcakes. It became very clear that people on Twitch like watching games, but not actually playing 
games, at least games like poker that require a lot of money. And um, that was that was an interesting revelation to me. So I decided to make something that they could get cheaply, and that was those books. All right. You want to get better at tournaments. Should you play as much as you can per your bankroll over the year? I mean, well, if you're trying to get better at something, you should definitely study as much as you realistically can. You should work very hard at it. Oh, gosh, I've been missing all sorts of questions. Should you take shots with a, playing 200 with a bankroll less than 5K? No, that would be crazy. Be very, very disciplined. Should you play tournaments instead of cash games? Probably not if you're just starting. This is a great show. Well, thank you. Tell your friends about it. Yes, thank you. Tell all your friends. Sorry, Instagram, I missed all of your posts. How soft is 200, 400 on other sites compared to Stars? Stars is thought to have some of the tougher games. Um, so knowing that, I would suggest you play elsewhere. The incumbent sites are usually tougher than the other side sites. The sites don't have near as much traffic. But the problem with those sites is often there's not as much traffic, right? Do I ever play online? I played online last week. It was last week? Maybe the week before. I was in the Bahamas. I played a decent amount on party poker. And also I was in Montreal. I played a decent amount on party poker. It was a lot of fun. I took like, uh, what did I take? I think, I think I took like 20th place in a $500 tournament with like 800 people. I lost with aces. I was just reviewing the hands. Actually, they're going to be going on poker coaching <laughs> as quizzes. And I lost with aces. I got it all in with aces against queens. Board was like 10-7-3. We got it all in for a decent chunk. And he backdoored a flush to bust me in 20th place in the $500 tournament where first was like, I don't even know, 40K or something. So instead I got 2,000 bucks. So that was, that was a nice run. But anyway, if you're trying to get better at a game, you should play it as much as you can. Assuming the opportunity cost is not that big. Like let's say you... Where instead, um, you could be playing two five no limit, making fifty bucks an hour. You should probably just do that and make your fifty bucks an hour, and then move to five ten and make a hundred bucks an hour, and then you'll be able to just make tons of money whenever you want. Then you can jump into tournaments, and it's like it doesn't matter if you win or lose. You studied an upswing strat. It'd be nice if there's a way to just know how to up go on an upswing. Does that just mean playing well? You learn to play well? Okay, so if you learn to play well, but at your casino it goes three to five ways even after you raise huge. What are the adjustments? Well, obviously stop bluffing, right? We're playing against calling stations. When you play against calling stations, you want to bluff less often. So a good way to have an upswing is to play against players who are calling stations and then just stop bluffing. Easy, right? You don't need to be bluffing if they're going to call you every time. That said, another good way to go on an upswing is to have... Players who call your raise very, very frequently and then just fold on the flop a lot. So in that scenario, you should raise and then make reasonably small bets, assuming those reasonably small bets will get you fold equity. Let's see. Am I playing the Players Championship in the Bahamas? I'm not. I'm having a baby soon. Baby trumps poker at the moment in my life. Maybe eventually I'll have so many babies where I don't care about any of them, but at the moment I care about my children. So, no, I'm not going to go to the Bahamas as soon as I have a one-month-old. Let's see. We should stream online poker occasionally. No thank you. I have in the past, and um, it's just not that productive. Party poker doesn't allow a HUD. It sure allowed a HUD for me. Can we just play tight, solid, multi-way poker? If... HUDs are not allowed. You should do things that HUDs normally pick up on, like playing very loose, very aggressively. You should be actively trying to exploit the opponents. Is the email support at pokercoaching.com? It is. Yes, a good upswing strategy. If you want to win, find bad players and beat them. That is the best way to go on an upswing. A good way to go on a downswing is to find good players and play against them. Or a good way to go on a downswing is to find players who... Don't fold a lot and try bluffing them a lot. If someone's trying, if you're trying to bluff people a lot because you read on some website that you should bluff a lot and you're playing as players who don't fold, realize you're not, either you're not understanding what they said or they said something that's just dumb. One of the two. 
All right, let's see. You really enjoyed quiz number 382. That made you think for a while. Good, I have no clue which one 382 was, but um, <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. Clint says he's only on 136. Keep grinding. Come to play the Mid-States Poker Tournament this weekend in Minnesota. Something's telling me I'm not going to go to Minnesota this weekend because I'm having a baby anytime, anytime soon. Am I working on any new books? I am. I'm working with Michael Acevedo on Modern Poker Theory. I just posted an excerpt from it. A little short ex excerpt to get you excited. That is at jonathanlowpoker.com. Can't remember the exact URL. Go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash blog. And it'll be the first or second post right up there. So check that out. Dr. Mai says, he hopes I'm getting sufficient traffic to continue doing these. Well, whenever I have my baby, I'm going to have to cut out some things in my life. It's not going to be my family. It's not going to be PokerCoaching.com. It's not going to be my books. This one's high up on the chopping block because this takes a lot of time. People ask why I don't stream my online play on Twitch. Because it takes a lot of time, right? And I don't have time to just sit there and play poker all day on the internet anymore. That's just not what I do, right? I am way more productive and produce way more value for you all by doing other things. And it's important to recognize that, right? Whenever you sit and you play online poker for eight hours, you've just given up eight hours of work time. And I get a lot done in eight hours. Like today, my wife's at jury duty. Our nanny's here. I'm going to get a ton done today. And if I instead spent this time playing online poker, which I could do, I could sit here and play online all day, and I would make, what, a thousand bucks? I'm going to make way more than a thousand bucks doing the things that I do for all of you. And it's very important to understand that at some point, once you have an audience and once you can provide value to that audience and help them benefit their lives, you're just going to be way better off than doing things that are a little bit more selfish or a little bit more beneficial for exactly yourself. Have you read Alex Fitzgerald's new book? I have. I edited it. Hopefully it's not full of errors. <laughs> For those who don't know, I'm a part owner of D&B Poker. They are the publishing company that's published many of my books. And um, Alex Fitzgerald's books, Mike Sexton's book here, Phil Helmuth's book. They published all sorts of books. And um, I help them edit a lot. I'm editing Modern Poker Theory right now. It's a big one. It's going to be a tough one. It's good, though, because in order to edit books about poker, you have to be very good at poker. It turns out that you can't just hire an editor to edit, or edit a poker book. You'll end up with a mess. And... Instead, you need someone who is both good at writing and good at catching mistakes. Now, I don't profess to be good at uh, writing necessarily, but I'm definitely good at catching mistakes. And that often leads to relatively clean books. Even then, though, it's tough to edit a book. You're going to find that if you have like 10 people read a book, it's still going to have mistakes in it. It's crazy how hard it is to catch everything. Is tight aggressive play the best way to play live tournaments? Or is it all on the table draw? It's always on the table draw. You can certainly have a default strategy. Like if you were to show up in a regular small stakes live tournament, I would definitely play more loose and aggressive, more so loose splashy to try to make strong hands and then get paid off by players who um, will make very, very clear errors. I mean, I, I play lots and lots of hands whenever I'm playing early in a tournament. Um, so anyway, uh, it, it depends on the situation. I, I am pretty loose and splashy early in tournaments. Do you like the Solve for Why website? I've never been to the Solve for Why website. Is it worth it? Worth it is very relative. Very, 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 very relative. For example, um, is it worth it for me to buy a $5,000 guitar? No, but it is worth it for um, someone who's really good at guitar if they're a professional. Is it worth it for LeBron James to buy a basketball? His first one. Well, it turns out it probably was, right? And if you are a poker player and you play a lot of poker, is it worth it to you? I don't know. I don't even know what they charge. Let's say they charge a lot. Let's say they charge $5,000. I have no clue what they charge. I think it's like a live seminar. Um, is it worth it for you to pay $5,000 to get, I don't know, a day or two of information? And the question is, how well are you going to apply it? And perhaps more importantly, what are the alternatives? 5000 bucks is a lot of money. I don't know what they charge. Again, I, I can, I've never I've not been to their website. Bad marketing research on my part. But um, if they do charge a large chunk, are you going to get $5,000 in value? And the question is, I mean, the answer is maybe you are, maybe you aren't. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. 
but if you are playing on a regular basis and you presume they're going to give you very good, accurate information that will help you beat whatever game you're trying to learn, then it may be worth it. That said, I know that um, you can get pretty good coach poker coaching relatively cheaply. I mean, like, for example, I have the Inner Circle, right? We're going to promote my stuff now. It is 100 bucks a month, but we often run sales where you can get a year for, I don't know, let's call it 1000 bucks. Um, where every two weeks you get to get on the phone with me for 15 minutes and we talk about whatever situation you have. You also get to hear all the other people's questions. You get to ask me specific topics like this one would actually be a good mini webinar when to keep barreling the turn. Um, and you get that for, I don't know, 80 bucks a month, which comes out to, if each webinar is four hours long, you get two, four, so you're paying me 10 bucks an hour for the inner circle webinars. It's not very expensive, right? It's actually pretty cheap. And that's a good way to get private coaching at a very, very, very cheap rate. Did I play the party millions? I did not. I was in um, Las Vegas for a company retreat. What point in the tournament do you go from loose flashy to different? It depends on the opponents. How much do I charge for one-on-one -on -one training? I just upped the price because, remember, we were talking about things I have to cut out of my life. Private coaching is one of them because it only helps one person at a time. So now we're charging 500 bucks an hour. And... Um, so it's a difficult thing because I want to do as much private coaching as I can. I like it. It's very beneficial for the person you're working with. But at the same time, it is so bad in terms of helping other people because you help one person. I'm trying to think what I could do. You know what maybe I could do is if you come to me for coaching, maybe you're like required to let me record it and then I could use that to help other people. Maybe that's how we could scale it. I'm always trying to think about how to help lots and lots of people with my time instead of just one. And um, you have to understand, whenever you coach one person, you are helping them significantly, but you're not helping anyone else. And, and at that point, I am, I mean, I'm trying to help lots of people is what it amounts to. I'm not trying to help one person. And if we could scale it, we could do it. Maybe, maybe I just need to make, go back to the $300 an hour rate and just say, we're going to record this and we may use this to help other people in the future. Always finding out good ideas. Have I seen plans for Run It Once web poker website? I have, but I have not really followed it. All the various websites, in my mind, um, it's like I, whenever, whenever it exists, I'll believe it. When will Modern Poker Theory be released? Probably the World Series of Poker this year. Working on a book. So far, just jotting down things. Good. of hours devoted to a book? I don't know what you're asking, JFed. Let's see. You love poker coaching. It's engaging. Well, good. That's the point. Sorry, just reading all the, reading all the, the questions here. You need to do the homework. Why? Yes, you do need to do the homework. If you are... Um, if you are on PokerCoaching.com, make use of the homework. That's In my mind, that's like the most beneficial thing. I know everyone loves the quizzes because you get to play, whereas the homework is more like work. We're going to change the name, by the way. We're going to call those challenges from here on. People don't like homework. People like challenges, though. Um, the challenges are very beneficial because they force you to think about your whole range, not just how do I play my one specific hand. Lewis, uh, you, you must have missed what I said. If I allow, if I make people pay for private coaching and then record it and put it up for all to view for free, that won't work. Oh, it's not going to be free. Don't help people. Poker's already tough enough than Winky Face or something. Yeah, I mean, I agree. That, that That's the interesting thing about poker coaching. I think a lot of people don't think about those that people need to be at least reasonably competent to want to play, Right? Because you're playing for significant money. Even if you have no money, like when I first started playing with $50, I would buy in for $10, and that was a lot of money for me. I had to work, like, more than an hour to get that money. And if I had no confidence whatsoever, I would not have even tried, right? And that's why good, easy-to-understand training resources are valuable, because it gives people motivation and the skills to at least not get crushed. The worst thing that can happen, assuming you want poker to grow... 
Uh, the worst thing that can happen for a new player is for them to put $50 online, play with it, and lose in like five minutes, which is what happens because even, you know, five cent, 10 cent players are pretty good. And um, you need to teach people to, to at least be reasonably competent. And if they're not, it's not, it's not going to work out. And even then, as they move up higher and higher and higher, as people get better, they are willing to push the boundaries more. If they realize they're just bad, they're not going to push the boundaries, and then the high-stakes games don't run. All right, it's absurd. Is it absurd to you that there's no penalty for open folding on the river first act in Montreal? Open folding. Um, yeah, that should not be a rule. I would, I would definitely try to confirm it. Thomas says, you will miss a little coffee. It's been very rewarding. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you enjoy it. Um, the problem with a little coffee is it takes a lot of time, right? I say a lot of time. An hour a day may not seem like a lot of time. I understand all of you love it. But it's a popular show. But um, it takes a lot of time. I'm going to try to keep doing it, though. This, this is one of the things I'm going to try to not cut out. Actually, I'm not going to try to cut out anything. I have a bit of a problem where I'm almost a workaholic. I'm not very good at relaxing. Um, so my free time often involves a lot of work. The problem is when you have a baby, a lot of your free time goes away. Also, I know that I have two book projects. One's a little bit more of a secret project. I have Modern Poker Theory, which is almost done. Then one more secret project that I haven't even started on. Oh, and one more project, Excelling at Online No Limit Hold'em. I forgot to talk about that. Gosh, I haven't even started on that one. That's going to be a, a lot of work. So I have three, three book projects going on. And I was going to do those at night while I was watching the baby sleep because I should have four or five hours each night of doing nothing. And might as well work on books then. I could probably write three books in a month. What do you all think? I think people think they're halfway decent so I can take their money. There you go. <laughs> all right, let's see. Can you explain effective stack size? Effective stack size is essentially the shortest of the stacks involved in the hand. Multi-way gets difficult, but heads up. Let's say I have 1,000 big blinds and you have 10. We're only playing for 10 big blinds. 10 big blind poker. A maniac says, essentially, you like my books. It's frustrating to invest money into materials that are not very good. You have made tangible returns here. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. If cards hit a muck and the player misread their hand and thought their opponent had a better one, do you think they should be able to retrieve it? Um, it depends on the scenario. Depends on how they put them into the muck. If they take them and deposit them right hard into the muck and then say, oh, wait, I think I have something, now they're dead. If they like, kind of table their hand and it ends up landing on the muck, obviously that's still alive. So, um, you know, it depends on the scenario, but... I think you should be pretty loose with that. And as long as it is very obviously their cards, because you don't want to penalize people for being amateur, right? You want to you want to help the amateurs. You don't want to penalize the amateurs. That's why I don't really like penalties where... Um, actually, Al Hart, my, my programmer, got a penalty the other day because on the river, he bet with a straight on like a paired board. He got raised, didn't realize he got raised and just like snap tabled his hand because he thought he won, right? And then, actually, he ended up thinking for a while and then folding, because no one's min-raising you there without the, the, the boat. And then he folded, and then they gave him a penalty. Right? He didn't realize he was messing up. Obviously, he could, in theory, angle there by, like, trying to get a read. But he wasn't. He just thought he won the hand. And they gave him a penalty. Then he ended up winning the tournament. <laughs> so that's fun. All right. Instagram's telling me I have to leave. This, was, uh, this one went long. We have, we have one minute left. What else can we talk about for one minute? You can always turn on donations on YouTube. You wouldn't mind giving me a couple of bucks. If you want to give me a couple of bucks, go sign up to pokercoaching.com, buy an ebook. I purposely don't ask for donations. I ask for payment for the information I'm giving in the form of signing up for a training site, buying an ebook for five bucks. Doing things like that will help you and it will help me. And at the end of the day, I just want to help all of you. So if we can help all of you, we're good to go. And if you want to get back to me, buy something. I have plenty of stuff to buy. It'll provide you additional value. And um, that's all we're really trying to do here is help you all become the best you can be at poker and life. All right. Have a great day. I will. Um, I should be here tomorrow. I'm trying to think what I have to do tomorrow.
Maybe I won't be here tomorrow. There's a chance I won't be here tomorrow. I'm trying to think what I have to do. I don't know. I'll let you know. I'll post on Twitter if I can't be here, but I think I will be. See you then. Bye-bye.